Jesse tree was the tree stump. Isaiah 11 1. A tree will come out from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a plant will bear fruit. Jesse had seven sons, the youngest named David. Luke 2 4. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Jesus was a part of Jesse and David's family tree. This is our family tree. Then I'll add a family history next to Okay, so this is me and Aubrey. And then the puppy Mara. Yeah. And then it goes up to our parents, mommy and daddy, and then it goes up to their parents. Grandma and grandpa, and then it goes up to our uncles and cousins. And then the then, then it just goes up to Dana and Grandpa. It goes up to all um all those people. All our other cousins and others. And then it goes up to our great 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 not great 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 just great grandparents. That's our family tree. Your family tree will always live. Just as a family tree takes us through our family roots. The Jesse tree takes us through God's promise in the Bible. Greetings, welcome to our winter wonderland, which is our backyard. We were blessed by about a foot and a half of glorious snow the other day and just enjoying God's creation and the, the magnificence of a early, early winter snowfall. So blessings on you, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're standing here beside a great stump. And I guess actually a stump goes up to 24 inches on a hardwood. But it's a great stump and more of an oak tree. It was our trophy oak in our backwoods for years until about 15 years ago and a lightning strike must have hit the tree and, and just felled it. 
And most of the tree is still lying here beside us. It was actually a tree that we used for a family photo for Christmas years ago. It's kind of fun in our family because we have a great family story from the tree. Jan was determined that we should that we should mill that tree that had fallen, the wood that was fallen, and because it's oak and so beautiful, we thought it'd be great. So she contacted a fellow who has a portable sawmill from Berkshire and was thinking he could come out here and take a look and maybe mill the tree right on the spot. So we contacted him, sent pictures of the leaves so he'd know what kind of a tree it was and uh, it's an oak tree and not exactly sure what it was uh, specifically, but he was interested and we did a little more research and Janet found him on the internet and Berkshire, what is related to Burton. And then all of a sudden we got the word from him, why would you really want us to come out to take a look at that tree? After all, Berkshire is in the UK. Come across the pond to take a look at the tree. So that took care of that. We just left it laying there where it is and we left the, the stump as, it, as is and have enjoyed it ever since. But I was thinking about that in terms of Jesse and the stump of Jesse and the root of David. And I want to read a passage to you from Isaiah. And this is about two thirds of the way into the Old Testament. So turn there if you'd like, the book of Isaiah chapter 11. And many of us are doing work with the Jesse tree for our Advent celebration at Pilgrim this year, something we've been able to do at home. And I think all of us are enjoying it. Some great devotionals and great thoughts. And a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, and the spirit of knowledge and of might. We have all this picture of, of the genealogy of Christ and from the stump of Jesse will come David and then from David, the line of David will come eventually, actually about 40 generations later, will, be, will come uh, Jesus, our savior, uh, the great king, the great, great king of the universe and the spiritual king who can be king of our lives. And so we celebrate that as we look at the stump. And so in, the, in, in nature, we have these great pictures and it's awesome because a lot of times we go, well, wouldn't it be better if the Bible had metaphors that came out of say the computer world and so forth? But God chose metaphors from nature and from farming and so forth that would last for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. And so we still know about stumps and roots and branches and well, here it goes. So I have the, hat, the hatchet here and I was just cutting out a cherry tree. I must not tell a lie. I cannot tell a lie. I was cutting out the roots and trying to hide the stump so people wouldn't realize it was gone. So I used my mighty little hatchet for that. I was thinking about this tree. It hasn't, we ha that we've noticed anyway, put any shoots out, but it's a great stump. And a lot of stumps will send, send out shoots. In Saskatoon, we cut down a bunch of poplar trees in our parsonage yard. Probably got in trouble for that. If I did, and if I offended anyone, I apologize. But in any case, that tree and those trees sent out shoots like you wouldn't believe, pushed up our sidewalk, they came out everywhere. The roots were still alive. The shoots came out of the stumps and out of the roots, and there's life. And that's the picture. David's family, his generation, Jesse's family. Jesse was the father of David, Jesse's family all the way back to Abraham and even back to Adam and Eve when God gives the word to Eve that a seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. To Isaiah, to Isaiah where Isaiah prophesies these great prophecies about the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah, and we're reminded that from this mighty stump will come forth a shoot that will be an everlasting king to an everlasting kingdom, a righteous, king a righteous judge so we've now moved to part two and to a second tree and this is now what we consider to be our trophy oak tree right out in front of the parsonage and there's a pretty neat story to this one as well so it turns out that jan and her mom were really into pruning about say 10 years ago 15 20 20 years ago whatever really we're, we're into pruning and we had planted this tree as a small sapling and it promptly died and everything died the leaves fell off we well we decided to keep the tree so we pruned off all the branches and all that was left was a 12 foot stick and people came over and went you know what's going on here 
Throughout the winter, we got teased again and again about the stick that was standing out in front of the house. And wouldn't you know, in the spring, it just sprouted forth. New branches, new leaves, beautiful tree, and now it's our trophy oak. And so there's life, there's life where it's unexpected. There's life in the roots, and we see that and hear that in the story of King David. I almost feel like I'm back in Canada. I'm wearing my root shirt. Roots is a store in Canada that's kind of an upscale gap that Jan loves to shop at. Wearing my Sorel boots for the sake of surviving the winter. And then every time I think about genealogy and roots and family trees, if we go somewhere to find anything about our family, on my side of the family, we go to my cousin Carmen and she's our expert, our family expert on genealogies and roots. And it's pretty exciting, very neat. And just such a reminder that God is in control and God has set in, into creation reminders of his kingdom and his family. Speaking of families, remember Kunta Kante and the miniseries Roots from back in the 70s? As far as I remember, well, some of us are old enough to remember watching that miniseries. And I think there were over 100 million Americans that watched that series. And uh, really interesting, uh, following the life of a slave from West Africa up into Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland, and then down to Virginia, and the story of family after family, generation after generation, told by Alex Haley. And supposedly true, at least parts of it are true uh, to life, and seven generations of family, of roots, uh, that are told in that story. And it was a fascinating story and, and widely loved and, and uh, really raised a lot of important issues for us. And I just think of that and go, wow, family tree, the history, the roots, and how we're blessed in Scripture and in our Christian life with our history. So go, go back to Isaiah 11.1. 1. And again, two-thirds of the way into the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is filled with, with prophetic material and many, many messianic prophecies, prophecies about the coming of Christ as the Messiah. 11.1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And so the family of Jesse is a very, very significant family. Jesse is the father of David. And it's from the line of David that Joseph goes to Bethlehem to be born in the city of David or the town of David. It's from David and his line that Jesus is born. David, the great king, the great king. Things start in terms of prophetic prophecy and fulfillment. And by the way, uh, talk about faith builders, uh, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in Christ and in other stories from the New Testament. Genesis chapter 3, first book of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And Adam and Eve have eaten of the forbidden fruit. Satan's tempted them through the serpent, and they've been tempted, they've hidden away, they've fallen, and we call this the fall. And God has judged them, but now he provides an offer to them, a rescuer, a savior. And he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And we believe that means that Satan will strike the heel of Jesus, that he'll lead him to the crucifixion. We believe that's a reference to the crucifixion and the passion of Christ. He will crush the head of the serpent, the head of Satan, by dying on the cross, the very thing that Satan drove him to. He'll die on the cross for our sins in obedience to the will of the Father, and then he'll be raised again from the dead, ascend into heaven, and he'll come again. And so we believe this is a proclamation of Christ and his victory over sin and death and Satan. And prophesied early, early on, and the seed of the woman will accomplish this. Then go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, in the beginning of the nation of Israel. This is really a pretty amazing passage. It's the call of Abram. And the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, 
the beginning of the nation of Israel. I will make you into a great nation, a new nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And you go through Abram? Well, through his family, through his roots, through his... And we go on and on through the family tree of Abraham and his genealogy and so forth. And we go, yes, Jesus will come through this family. And all the world will be blessed through him. Head back to Isaiah. Head back to Isaiah. And I want to read a little bit more of that passage, Isaiah chapter 11, and starting with verse 1. And just listen carefully. It's a fascinating passage. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Remember the righteous judge? Talked about the, the last two Sundays. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Who doesn't want a king like that? He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Then listen to this, and this sounds like a prophecy of a coming kingdom, maybe a millennial kingdom or some kingdom of, of great peace. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Peace will be so great that a little child will be able to lead these various animals. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. The earth will be at peace. God's creation will live in harmony. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. His nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. And jump to verse 12. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Remember that passage. He will raise a banner for the nations, gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Now, remember the righteous judge. Head to Jeremiah 23, verse 5. And God is, through his Holy Spirit's power and persuasion, leading Isaiah and Jeremiah to write these incredible prophecies. And here Jeremiah writes, The days are coming. This is Jeremiah 23, 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. And this is probably a prophecy with multiple fulfillment, but we see a coming king who will be righteous and just. Of course, David was like that. Solomon to some degree. A lot of the kings weren't, but Israel had its godly kings. But ultimately, a king who would come, who would be known as the Lord of righteousness. And we believe that with all our hearts, that that leads us to Jesus Christ. One more time, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David, or in David's line, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Then, head to the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, some fulfillment. The Gospel of Luke, third Gospel, and we begin to read 
about Jesus as he fulfills these passages. And we look at the genealogies, both in Matthew and Luke. We listen to the Christmas story and the promise of Jesus and his birth foretold by an angel. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. And in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with a child, and you will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great among you and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Remember that that child would be John the Baptist. Then this powerful, powerful statement. For nothing is impossible with God. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary's response I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and we look at the genealogy of Christ according to Luke. The genealogy of Christ according to Luke. Luke 3, 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the, the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. And so forth, for 40 generations, to the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, and of Ruth. And now there's something really important to highlight here. Remember Ruth? Ruth was from Moab. And she was, because of her obedience to her mother-in-law, went to a foreign land and spent time in the fields and met her kinsman redeemer, or the kinsman redeemer who was Boaz, and they married, had a son. <laughs> the son was Obed. And then Obed's son is Jesse. And Jesse's son is David. And so Ruth, a Gentile, a Moabitess, becomes part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so even in the genealogy of Christ, you discover these great, great people who are brought into the family, into the family of God. And Paul in the book of Romans picks up on that, Romans chapter 15, and listen to this great passage from Paul in Romans 15, sixth book of the New Testament, and one of the great writings of the Apostle Paul. Romans 15, 12, first, and he records Isaiah as he prophesies this. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. And that means us, all of us. Every tribe, every nation will find hope in him, in the root of Jesse. And Paul, of course, is referring to Jesus Christ as Jesus fulfills this great prophecy. Romans 15, 12. Let's look at Romans 15, 7 through 13. Remember the story of Jesse, the Moabitess Ruth, and how Ruth becomes a part of this family. And God invites non-Israelites again and again to be a part of his family of faith.
Romans 15, verses 7 through 13. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over all the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. So I proclaim this to you today as we celebrate in our church the practice of the Jesse tree and and thinking about Jesse and the prophecies and how they're fulfilled in Christ and the line of David and this great King David. And then ultimately the king leads, the kingdom of David leads to Jesus Christ, the great Messiah. And Jesus loves everyone in his creation, absolutely everyone. And he invites all of us to live for him, to follow him, to believe in him. And so I encourage you to invite Christ into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit as he persuades you to believe and to follow him. And we're given this great gift. What better gift, what better way to celebrate Christmas and its presence than in the presence of Jesus Christ and to make him a part of our lives and welcome him into our hearts and our lives. He welcomes all people. He welcomes you. He welcomes me. Believe. And then Paul closes with this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.